Welcome back, everybody. This is Earth and Space Science 102. I'm Stephanie Welch, and I'm very, very excited to be bringing you the um, the very last unit of this class. So if you remember from the beginning of uh, this, this class, in the beginning of 102, uh, we are separating the subject into three sort of discrete little units. The first one had very little to do with the other two. The first of the three units was all about meteorology. So that was all the weather and climate stuff. The second unit brought us into astronomy, but restricted us to talking about our solar system. And just to make that clear, again, that's all of the objects that are gravitationally bound by our sun, everything that is extremely close to us in the universe. The reason why I'm so excited to be getting into the third unit is because we're going to get out of our solar system and talk about everything else. So in terms of the total amount of space we're covering, the total amount of area that we're looking at, uh, we're almost going to be looking at an infinite amount of material outside of our solar system. We, our sun and our solar system is just one of billions and billions of stars only in our galaxy. And our galaxy is only one of billions and billions of galaxies in the observable universe. So being untethered from our solar system and looking beyond, that's going to be really, really exciting. Now, the problem with all of this is that we are incredibly limited in the amount of information that we have about anything going on outside of our own solar system, because even the Voyager probes launched in the late 1970s and having made their way as far away from the Earth as any object that humans have ever launched into space, they still have not even gotten outside of our own solar system. So I can't stress this enough. The only information that we have about the broader universe beyond our solar system comes from light. So these first two lectures of this unit are going to deal with the nature of light and what kind of information we can and can't get from light. As it turns out, you can actually get an incredible amount of information just from the light of, from an object. You can determine an object's composition. You can determine its temperature. You can even determine a certain aspect of the object's motion. You can tell how far away the stars are, how big the universe is, all only from this one source of information, only from the light. So taking that into consideration, the first thing that we have to do is define what light is. And this is not something that's very easy to define. It's not something that's going to be terribly easy to understand. As opposed to other things that travel from a source, light travels extremely fast. In fact, nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So it travels almost so fast that you would almost think that it doesn't have a speed to it at all, that it's instantaneous, that light can travel even immense dense distances in the blink of an eye. But as it turns out, the larger the distance between you and the object that's producing the light, the longer it takes for that light to travel. So light does actually have a speed limit. Light does actually have a um, constant speed in which it travels. And one reason why it does this is because light actually acts as a wave, similar to ocean waves or sound waves, any other wave that we could be talking about. So it is a wave, and visible light is just part of the overall electromagnetic spectrum, uh, one type or one wavelength along that overall spectrum. So at the same time that it acts as a wave, it also acts as a particle. The individual particles that compose light are these energetic little particles called photons. And these photons travel outwards from mainly hot objects in space, a long wave-like pattern. So because light travels as a wave, that allows us to kind of break it down a little bit and to begin to understand it and compare it to other waves that we know. The thing that's going to be almost uncomparable to other waves that we already know is the immense speeds that light takes. Take, for instance, um, comparing the speed of light to the speed of sound. Sound travels at 0.3 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast. It's pretty hard to break the sound barrier. It's pretty hard to even travel faster than the speed of sound. But light travels seven orders of magnitude faster than the speed of sound. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. And that's why nothing travels faster than the speed of light, why this is an impossibility in, in physics.
Now, to understand this, to understand what the speed of light is, we have to kind of break down light into, into um, all of these different parts of uh, what it is to be something that moves along in a wave. So anything that moves as a wave, we can break down and understand in terms of its wavelength and its frequency. The wavelength is the more simple of these two to understand, and the one that's going to be most crucial to understanding the difference between all of the different colors in visible light and all of the other different types of invisible light or undetectable light. So a wavelength is just the repeat distance. Um, the wavelength in terms of something like an ocean wave would be from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave. And while that distance might be large, that might be several feet of distance, most of the wavelengths, uh, particularly of visible light, are going to be incredibly small. It's only going to be things like radio waves that have extremely large wavelengths that you know occur in, in units that we can sort of begin to understand as humans. The wavelength of visible light is around the size of a red blood cell in your body, um, between 400 and 700 nanometers. So that's one of the things that we have to understand to understand all of these different uh, uh, types of light that we're going to be dealing with is what is the wavelength of that light. The other thing that we have to understand is what is the frequency of that wave. So the frequency is the number of waves that occur over a given period of time. So it's really sort of the inverse of time. It's some number, it's some dimensionless number, like 12 or 200, over a unit of time, like seconds. That's a unit called a hertz. So when we understand the wave's wavelength and its frequency, we can actually determine the speed of that wave. Because if you multiply the two against each other, you have distance in terms of your wavelength, and you have one over time. And so when you multiply those two together, you actually get a distance over time. You get a rate or a speed in which that light travels. And light traveling in a vacuum, and outer space is a vacuum, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. Not quite infinitely fast, but at least from our perspective, practically instantly, um, infinitely fast. It makes it possible to, let's say, switch on the lights in a room and immediately have the room flooded with light. You don't even really detect that light. That light actually takes time to travel from your light bulb to the far sort of dark shadowy corners of your room. So this also sort of introduces one of the other reasons why light is so important to us. Because space is a vacuum, because space doesn't have anything for something like sound to move in, light is the only thing that actually can travel from distant objects and reach us here on Earth. Take, for instance, if, uh, let's say, two black holes colliding, if that actually produced sound waves, not only would they take a ridiculously long time to travel across the universe, it's actually impossible for that sound to travel through space. Because things like sound waves take require a substance to move through. They need to move through and manipulate and shift around and compress molecules and, and atoms. Um, only something like light can travel through nothingness. All right, so the next thing that we're going to get into talking about is the difference between what we call visible light and the visible light spectrum and essentially invisible light and the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum, the EM spectrum. So the visible light makes up everything that we can actually see. And you really have to think about us as being incredibly limited when we look out into space, even through a telescope. And we're limited in the idea that we can only see just this tiny, tiny little part of the overall spectrum, only the visible light spectrum. Probably having evolved on Earth and Earth's atmosphere being conducive to allowing this part of the spectrum to get through the atmosphere into the surface has allowed us to be able to detect this light, mainly as an evolutionary mechanism. You've got a step up if you can actually see and look around you, see predators coming, all that kind of stuff. So we've evolved to be able to see this very small part of the spectrum, um, only ranging from around 400 to 700 nanometers. 
So that, in comparison to the entire rest of the spectrum, is far, far less than 1% of all of the light that all of the objects out there in space actually produces. So that, that part of the spectrum from 400 to 700 ranges from the shorter wavelengths of visible light. That's the blue-violet end of the spectrum. Those are the shorter, more energetic particles to the longer wavelength, lower energy part of the spectrum, up to 700. As you see the combination of all of those different wavelengths coming in, they come in together as white light. Passing that light through a prism allows you to break it up into all of the different individual wavelengths from the red all the way down to the violet. So that's just the visible light spectrum. And the visible light spectrum does have applications in astronomy. It is important to be able to detect these objects in visible light. Looking up unaided, looking up without the aid of a telescope, restricts you to only the light that your pupils and your eyes can collect and only the visible light spectrum. The rest of the spectrum, both what we've been able to detect and probably a whole bunch of other types of waves that we've never been able to detect before, makes up what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, the EM spectrum. So this ranges from all of the other wavelengths of light that you've heard of probably, but you didn't really realize were related in some way to visible light. This includes radio waves, microwaves, uh, infrared, gamma rays, UV rays, X-rays. These are all different wavelengths ranging from far larger than visible light to far smaller than visible light of the electromagnetic spectrum. So to give you, again, sort of a little kind of tiny glimpse, a little sliver of what we can see versus what else is out there and produced by objects in the universe, I wanted to show you this entire range going from the very, very shortest wavelengths of gamma rays. And those gamma rays have an overall wavelength around the size of a width of an atom, incredibly, incredibly small wavelengths, to the very, very largest radio waves that might have an overall wavelength length the size of a football field, or even maybe the size of the diameter of a planet. That's the overall range that we're talking about here. It's almost as big of a range as you deal with in all of science, between the very, very small and the infinitely large. Things like gamma rays allow us to understand events like colliding neutron stars, colliding black holes. They produce gamma ray bursts, and we're just beginning to understand gamma rays and what produces them and uh, the, the effect that they have on us and the effect that they have on the universe. Things like x-rays are really crucial in understanding black holes and neutron stars, all of these things that form after a star's lifespan and don't produce a lot of light after the normal part of the star's existence. These things would be virtually undetectable. We wouldn't even be able to see them in visible light, but they appear to us on x-ray. Uh, things like uh, UV to the infrared, we use those in addition to the visible light spectrum to understand objects that are also visible you know, without using all of these other wavelengths of light. Things like stars, um, hot objects, uh, nebula, solar systems, planets, and, and so on. Things like microwaves, a longer wavelength part of the electromagnetic spectrum getting up into radio waves, are both the individual wavelength best calculated to heat up the water molecules in your food. So that's why a microwave oven uses microwaves to heat up the, your, your food. It's, it's coming from the same name. Um, those are actually really crucial in understanding the beginning of the universe. Uh, the very, very most distant thing that we can actually see as microwave background radiation from the Big Bang, from the origin of the universe itself. And then finally, the longest wavelengths of light are the radio waves, and they allowed us to detect things like neutron stars from the very beginning. So again, I can't stress this enough, and I don't want to harp on about it, but I can't stress this enough that um, understanding and truly understanding the cosmos, the universe beyond our solar system, everything that's out there, requires us to not only use what we can see, but what we can essentially not see, what might be detectable by a machine that we can invent, but not detectable by our eyes.
So all of these different wavelengths of light, both visible and essentially invisible, things like radio waves and others, are going to interact with matter. Now, when this light is just traveling through the vacuum of space, it's not interacting with matter. It's not really doing much of anything at all. It's just transmitting through um, a vacuum. Once that light gets into, let's say, the Earth's atmosphere or starts to interact with the Earth's surface, then it's going to actually influence that matter. It's going to change the state of that matter a little bit. And what we eventually see on the Earth's surface is a combination of what that light was doing originally and the composition of the material that it's traveling through. So this is going to have implications a little bit later on when we look at, uh, uh, let's say, the composition of the outer atmosphere of a planet or the composition of a star. That is also going to be determined by not only the light, but how the light interacts with matter. So this should be a little bit of a review, but there are some basic ways that light and matter interact. Light can be emitted from matter. Uh, very, very particularly when objects are really hot, it can emit light. So mainly stars are the things that are doing this. And stars are going to be obviously the most visible objects out there beyond our solar system. Not the only objects, but because they are incredibly hot for the duration of their lifetime, they're going to be producing a tremendous amount of light. So we say that they are emitting light. They are emission objects. So just like a light bulb, again, a hot object, Something like the sun or any other star is going to be emitting light and creating that light to begin with. And that light is originally created from matter. Um, when you get matter up to really, really high temperatures, particles can collide, go through this process of fusion, and create that light. So not only can objects create light, objects, certain objects are capable of allowing that light to transfer through material. So take, for instance, glass in your window or the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Certain wavelengths of light are able to be transmitted through that material. And then finally, once you get to maybe a more dense object like the Earth's surface, a blade of grass, the roof of a building, then matter can either, a uh, light, I'm sorry, can either be absorbed or reflected and scattered off of that surface or both. And what happens, whether it's absorbed or reflected in individual wavelengths, is going to be entirely dependent on the composition of that material. So take, for instance, when light gets absorbed, if you go outside on a nice warm day and you're wearing all black, everybody knows you're probably going to get a lot warmer than somebody who might be wearing white. And the reason why you're going to get warmer, why that shirt's going to get warmer, is because that shirt and the dye and the composition of that shirt is going to be absorbing not just the longest wavelength of visible light, not just the shortest, but all of the wavelengths of visible light, in addition to a bunch of other wavelengths of light that are able to get through the Earth's atmosphere, like infrared. So the exact composition of that dye is going to be conducive to allowing for the absorption of all of those wavelengths of light. And what you see when all of those wavelengths are going to be absorbed by the object and none of it's reflected or scattered is the absence of light, essentially. It's going to be black. So if you have, let's say, a green dress on, like what I'm wearing, what's going to happen is that all of the other wavelengths of light are going to be absorbed by the object, and this dress is going to reflect or scatter just the sort of shorter wavelength end of the visible light spectrum, just this particular shade of green on the spectrum. So what we ultimately see is going to be dependent on what is reflected or scattered off of that surface. And we talk about reflection a lot, but ultimately it really comes down more to scattering. Most objects are not going to reflect light like light off of a mirror. Instead, most objects are going to allow for light to be just sort of scattered off in all directions. Meaning, essentially, that my dress is still going to be green no matter where you're standing or wherever you're looking at me. It's still going to be a green object. So the interactions between light and matter are going to influence everything that we see. Whether you have maybe a red chair or the walls of your house might be uh, painted blue, it's all going to go back to the individual composition of that object. It's a lot easier to understand this, strangely enough, 
if we go outside of the earth and we look at something that's naturally occurring as opposed to something that's unnaturally occurring, like the dye in your shirt. If we look, for instance, at the, um, the atmosphere of Mars, the reason why Mars has a red atmosphere, why the entire planet, in fact, looks red, is because of the composition of its atmosphere and what happens when light reaches that atmosphere and scatters off from the surface. The carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere is going to effectively scatter back out into space the longer wavelengths of visible light, making that planet's atmosphere look red. Once upon a time, Earth's atmosphere was probably red, because if you remember, Earth's atmosphere used to have a very different composition than our atmosphere today. We have this tremendous amount of oxygen in our atmosphere today, around 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. It wasn't always there. If you go back a couple billion years into our past, originally we had a lot more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So we think that Earth's atmosphere two and a half billion years ago, if you were to look up into the sky, it would look red instead of blue. So a great example of interactions between light matter is just the simple, simple answer to the question, why is the sky blue? Why are sunsets red? Why are the atmospheres of all of these different planets and all of these different objects colored differently? And it all goes back to composition, essentially. Take, for instance, the Earth's atmosphere. When the light from the sun comes into the Earth's atmosphere from a fairly steep angle, so throughout the sort of normal part of the day, light comes into the Earth's atmosphere, and the exact composition of our atmosphere, mainly nitrogen, a fair amount of oxygen, is going to scatter all of the shorter wavelengths of visible light, effectively scattering the, to um, the, the most intense degree the lighter color blue, that sky blue that you know so well. Then the longer wavelength, less energetic particles are actually going to make their way all the way through the Earth's atmosphere and get absorbed by the surface. So the red is easily able to get all the way through the Earth's atmosphere, be absorbed by the surface. The shorter wavelengths, sort of averaging out to that sky blue, are going to get scattered. So when you look up into the sky, you see that interaction between light and matter and you see a blue sky. Something slightly different occurs when the sun is really low in the sky, Take, for instance, sunset and sunrise, when the light's coming in through a thicker slice of the Earth's atmosphere and having to travel a longer way through the Earth's atmosphere. What happens is that the atmosphere is effectively going to do the same thing to all these different wavelengths of light. It's going to scatter away the blue, and it's going to allow the, light, the red to penetrate all the way through. But the blue light is going to get scattered back out into space. The longer wavelength red light is actually going to make its way all the way through, and just enough of that gets scattered that, so that the sun at sunset appears to be red. So what's doing this is not the color of that object to begin with, because the sun is always yellow, and the temperature of that object is going to determine its color in that case. It's the fact that that light's traveling through the Earth's atmosphere, interacting with the matter there. Now, to understand any more about the nature of light and to get a certain amount of information from this light, we have to take light from objects and pass it through a prism. So the first person to do this was Newton, Isaac Newton. He was the first one, we think, to really take light from an object and by really trying to understand it and understand its nature, one of the things that he did was to pass that light through a prism. And of course, you create a rainbow. You break down the white light, the sum of all of the individual um, components of that visible light, into uh, Roy G. Biv, essentially, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue blue indigo violet. You break it down into its spectrum. Now what he failed to do and what scientists later like Josef Fraunhofer would eventually do was to take that light that passed from the sun through the Earth's atmosphere through a prism and then look at that light through a telescope. What he was then able to do is to concentrate that light and to see almost sort of the equivalent of like a hidden message in that light and to determine things like chemical composition from that light. 
So it's almost like in the light, if you're paying enough attention, if you're able to look at it with individual tools like a prism and a telescope, you're able to see not just the light that everybody else can see, you're able to see the, the message that reveals information about that object. So the first crucial part of this is, of course, taking the light from that object and passing it through a prism. Then you create a spectrum. Uh, the reason why Newton came up with this term spectrum, or a spectra, if you're talking about mini spectrum, is, is this word is Latin for phantom. This was such a, a mysterious force, uh, what, what, what creates light, what light is, the way that light breaks down into all of these individual components and breaks down into a rainbow. It was so mysterious that he essentially named it Latin for a phantom. So when you take that light and you break it down into all of its individual components, you see not only continuous light, or what we would call the continuous part of a spectrum, if you're able to concentrate that light like Josef Fraunhofer did and look at it through a telescope or even maybe look at it um, through any kind of lens to concentrate that light, you're able to see all of the details. You're able to see the emission line and the absorption line parts of that object spectrum. So you're able to see essentially the incomplete parts of the spectrum, the parts that are mainly absorbed, where you're sort of missing pieces of information. One of the things that's really interesting to me is that you can actually be essentially missing information because this light has to travel through the Earth's atmosphere or through a nebula from some distant star to reach us. You can essentially be missing information, and that allows it to be more useful than it would if you had the full continuous spectrum. You can actually learn more about the object when you have this emission line and absorption line parts of the spectrum. So the past spectrum that you see on this slide here, where we've got the chart of intensity versus all of these different wavelengths, ranging from short wavelength, ultraviolet light, all the way up to red and the infrared part of the spectrum, um, infrared being sort of uh, a below red, uh, being even larger wavelength uh, 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 light than the red part of the spectrum, so this is the invisible part. What you're able to see when you kind of break all of this down is first the emission line part of the spectrum where you have those peaks in intensity following along with uh, where light is actually going to be emitted and everything else that's not emitted is lower in intensity or almost ex exclusively absorbed, the continuous part of the spectrum, and then the absorption line part of the spectrum where you're essentially missing little bars of information. You have little blacked out lines. What you could determine from the spectrum of this object is everything from composition to the temperature of this object, the temperature being what is going to control where the peak part of the spectrum occurs, um, to even if you had a control of what the object would look like stationary, you can even determine a certain aspect of the object's motion, the fa whether or not it was moving towards or away from you. Okay, so again, we've got all of these different types of spectrum, and a continuous spectrum is something that's going to be produced when you have a hot object, like let's say light from the sun, that light traveling through a prism, and that light being um, projected onto a surface. The continuous spectrum from a hot object, and we're going to call these hot objects black bodies, these hot objects are going to produce a continuous spectrum. But if you took the light from that same object and passed it through some uh, cooler surface, like let's say a cloud of gas, a, a nebula, or even the gas in the Earth's atmosphere, then that light would have to travel through a prism, and then you'd have to, um, what would eventually happen would be that you'd break it down into all of these absorption line or either emission line spectra. So an object like the sun, if you were able to capture the light from that object outside of the Earth's atmosphere, pass it through a prism and break it down into all of the individual wavelengths, you would see an almost entirely continuous spectrum. So a hot object is going to produce light at all um, individual wavelengths. It's going to be the peak and intensity of those wavelengths that is going to be uh, you know, where we can actually determine the temperature of that object. So it's the continuous part of the spectrum. 
light that has to pass through something cooler like the gas of the Earth's atmosphere or from a nebula ends up being broken in some way. It's going to be composed of absorption line spectra or even possibly emission line spectra. And these are going to be basically sort of the inverse of each other. An absorption line spectrum is going to be a mainly continuous spectrum where you have little blacked out lines, lines that we're going to call Fraunhofer lines. These are parts of the spectrum that didn't essentially reach us. These are going to just be individual little black lines where we don't have that particular wavelength from that object anymore. The inverse of that is if you have almost entirely absorbed spectrum and you have individual little peaks in intensity. Those are going to be emission lines and those are going to compose an emission line spectrum. So using this, using this idea that the light from the object is going to typically kind of have to pass through something, like at least the Earth's atmosphere before it reaches us, it then this is going to allow us to determine all of this really cool information about the object. And it's really crucial at this point to remember that more information is not necessarily better in this context. Having a completely continuous spectrum would allow us to not understand everything that we need to understand about these objects. Take for instance the spectrum of the Sun, which is what you're seeing on this next slide here. You're seeing the complete stellar spectrum from this one object from our Sun, having passed through 150 million kilometers of space through the Earth's atmosphere to reach us possibly with a prism and a telescope on the Earth's surface where we can actually break down this light and see it in all of its different wavelengths. Some parts of the spectrum are going to be continuous, and where it peaks in intensity is going to correlate to its temperature. So we'll look at that a few slides later. We'll look at that component of information, how we can determine temperature from light. The first thing that we're going to be able to determine based on the placement of these absorption lines is the composition of the object, the composition of the sun. We're going to be able to know and not just assume that the sun is composed of all the same basic elements that we are composed of and the earth is composed of. Not just hydrogen and helium, but things like calcium and iron. Those are all going to be present in the atmosphere of the sun. We could even determine from an object spectrum whether the object is moving towards us or away from us, which is sort of a moot point for the sun because we're in orbit around it. It's not going to really shift in position. So that's all of the information that we'll be able to determine about an object, and it mainly goes back to those emission and absorption line parts of the spectrum. So the first and most interesting thing that we can determine about any of these objects that are producing light, not just a closer object like our sun that we're practically right on top of, but some really distant star or even a distant galaxy, is its chemical composition. And to me, this is the most amazing thing that we can determine uh, judged solely from light. Now the way this works is light from an object is going to be emitted and the wavelengths of light that are going to be emitted are in part going to be controlled by the object's composition. So when matter is heated up, what's actually going to be happening here is that at the atomic level, individual atoms are going to be composed of these protons, neutrons, and electrons. And these electrons, when heated up, are capable of bouncing around to different energy levels. They disappear from one energy level and then move up to the next, and then up to the next. When they actually move backwards and they move down in an energy level, this creates a spectral fingerprint, essentially. This allows us to understand the composition of that individual atom. So if in uh, some distant object, a star is composed of, let's say, uh, sodium or neon, this leaves a individual little fingerprint in the placement of these emission and absorption lines. So what we can take away from this is that the exact placement of these emission and absorption lines gives us an indication of the object's composition. Probably much more impressively, this has allowed us to understand that all the same basic ingredients that make up Earth, all these same common ingredients, hydrogen, helium, calcium, sodium, all of these same basic elements on Earth also compose the sun, and they also compose distant stars and even galaxies far, far removed from our own on the opposite side of the universe. 
Everything in the universe is made of the same stuff, and we can prove that by looking at the object spectrum and seeing the same fingerprint for let's say, neon or iron or barium that we would see from an object that was relatively close to us, that we can actually individually determine its composition. So everything in the universe is made of the same stuff, essentially, Um, all originally composed in the heart of stars, all originally sort of constructed in stars, spread out into the universe to eventually compose planets and, and so on. So everything in the universe is made up of the same periodic table of elements that you've seen all along through your entire life and compose everything on Earth. The second piece of information that we can determine from light is the temperature of the object. And this is far, far easier to understand. This is very, very basic. And you've observed this probably many, many times on the surface of the Earth. You may not have known that it correlated to an individual wavelength versus temperature, but you innately know that, let's say, a part of a bonfire that's going to be red is actually going to be a little bit cooler than the part of a fire that's blue. As you get into, let's say, the deeper, hotter part of something like a bonfire, it's actually going to take on more of a white to blue color because the temperature is greater there. So temperature and color are going to correlate to each other. And the reason why this happens is because hot objects, and this would apply to a bonfire, this applies to a distant star as well, hot objects are going to emit light across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, but they're going to peak out at an individual wavelength. And where they peak out in intensity is going to correspond to the object's temperature. An object is going to produce more of the wavelengths of light at a greater intensity towards the shorter wavelength end of the spectrum when the object is hotter. And what we know that to be in terms of color is going to be closer to the blue end of the spectrum. An object that is going to be a little bit uh, um, uh, a lower in temperature, it's going to be a cooler object, actually produces a peak at the longer wavelength, less energetic part of the spectrum, and it produces a red color. So take, for instance, stars are going to range from red to white to blue, and the red stars are going to be the coolest. A yellow star like ours is going to be somewhat on the sort of cool end of the spectrum as well, and then they range to white, which is going to be sort of this uh, combination right in the middle of the visible light spectrum, and then they can even be blue. So stars occur in a range of colors, and the reason why they occur in a range of colors is because they have a range of surface temperatures, and that's what you're able to actually determine from an object spectrum is the surface temperature of the object. The law that allows us to calculate this is called a Wind's Law. The wavelength and the temperature of the object are going to be influenced by each other. That's basically what this law means. In this law, you have wavelength equals k over t. k is almost an ignorable number in all of this. It's a constant. So the two variables that are actually going to be important here is the wavelength, that little um, uh, uh, lambda m, and then the t for temperature. So they have an inverse relationship to each other. As temperature increases, the wavelength is actually going to decrease. So that means as you increase the temperature of the object, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And that wavelength, having gotten shorter and shorter and shorter, means that it's going to peak out at closer to the bluer end of the spectrum. So you know this innately already, you know this based on what happens with objects on the Earth's surface, but you can also now apply this concept to astronomical objects. In the picture you can see how those coils on an old-fashioned electric burner are going to range from red to yellow to white, and if you were able to increase the heat even more, they would even uh, turn blue. And this is because as the temperature increases, the wavelength actually decreases. This is an application of Wind's Law on the Earth's surface, on something mundane like a stovetop.
So the temperature scale that we're going to use throughout the uh, really the rest of the semester, it's going to apply to temperatures at the surface of the sun, the core of stars, um, black holes, and, and so on. And it's going to mainly be the Kelvin temperature scale. Because I'd like to kind of remind everybody at this point that the Kelvin temperature scale is based around this idea that all temperature is, is the average kinetic energy of all the particles that make up a substance. If those particles are moving around really, really, really fast, all that really means is that you have a higher overall temperature than if those particles were moving really slow. There's no negative on the Kelvin scale, because if you were to get negative, you'd go beyond the point when those particles just slow down and stop moving. Zero or absolute zero on the Kelvin scale essentially just means that those particles have come to rest. They're no longer moving. We think that there really is no perfect absolute zero in the universe. There's always some small amount of temperature. Really, almost sort of the coolest that conditions ever get can almost be visible on the surface of Earth. We live, comparatively to other environments out there in the universe, in a pretty cold setting. You can see how the kind of range of temperatures that you get on the surface of the Earth might range from, you know, the couple hundred degrees Kelvin or a couple hundred Kelvin, there is no degrees, to maybe 400 degrees where water boils. So it's kind of the range of temperatures we have on the Earth's surface. The temperature at the surface of the sun is closer up to 6,000 Kelvin, or technically 5,830 Kelvin. And that's just at the object's surface. When you get into the very core of our sun and other stars, you get into ridiculously high temperatures in the millions of Kelvin. The core of our sun is thought to be at a range of temperatures approaching 15 million Kelvin. And at that temperature, individual particles are no longer repulsed by each other because they're moving around so fast, they can slam together and become one. And matter and energy become uh, transmutable. You can turn one into the other. All right, so that was just a little brief recap of the Kelvin temperature scale and kind of wrapping up how we determine temperature from light. And again, we can't go up to an object, even our sun, stick a thermometer in it. So t the light from these objects is really the only way to calculate temperature, both for um, distant objects in our own solar system, like at the sun, and for objects outside of our own solar system. The last piece of information that I want to talk about that you can determine from light is going to involve the motion of that object. We can determine whether an object is moving towards you or away from you based on what happens to an object's spectrum, what kind of shift it has, whether it's red shifted or blue shifted. Now, to understand all this redshift and blue shift stuff and understand how this shift occurs, it really, really helps to uh, think about these things in terms of wavelength and think about that shift as having occurred because of a shift in the wavelength towards the shorter and towards the longer wavelength end of the spectrum. You can determine this, you can, you can use this same idea, um, and the idea is the Doppler effect. Even with different wavelengths, um, much, much longer wavelengths, much uh, slower wavelengths, you know, like sound, for instance, even sound comes across with the Doppler effect. If you have an object that's producing a sound and it's moving towards you or away from you, then you're going to hear a shift in that object's uh, wavelength and you hear it as a change in pitch. So not thinking about this in terms of light for just a second here, let's think about this in terms of sound because this actually ends up being a little bit easier to understand on the Earth's surface. Let's think about what a longer wavelength sound is versus what a shorter wavelength sound is. <clears throat> All right, so it's necessary to sort of clear my voice at this uh, point and, and try to adopt sort of like a, as close as I can come to a Neil deGrasse Tyson voice. If I change my voice a little bit and I talk down here and I talk at a really, really low pitch, what I've essentially done is shifted my voice to a longer wavelength sound. So when I drop down here, I'm actually producing a voice that has a longer overall wavelength. You hear it as a lower pitch. My 
closest approximation to like a Neil deGrasse Tyson voice or think about anybody else that has a deep voice. Now, if I did it in the opposite direction, if I tried to adopt a Minnie Mouse voice, if I talked up here, what I've done from my normal voice up to that higher pitch is to shorten the wavelength that results in a higher pitch. So what you hear is music, for instance, is just lots and lots and lots of different pitches all coming at you. Now, if pitch is going to correspond to wavelength, then we can even detect a shift in that wavelength if the object is moving towards you or away from you. Essentially, this is the reason why oh, ice cream trucks sound so incredibly creepy. Now, if you're just standing right next to an ice cream truck and they're just playing their music, their ice cream truck music, you know, they're playing some kind of cute little kid's tune, it doesn't really sound all that creepy. It just sounds like music coming out of a speaker attached to the top of a car. That's because there's no shift in the wavelength of that sound. But let's say that object was moving, that car was moving around and driving around a neighborhood. If it was driving towards you, you actually hear a slightly higher pitch than if the object was stationary because those wavelengths of sound get bunched up in front of the object as the object's moving towards you. If that object's moving away from you, the car, uh, the, uh, the ice cream truck, if it's moving away from you, then that actually creates a lower overall pitch. So whenever anything is sort of moving around like an ice cream truck or a police car, um, cars and NASCAR, they're zooming around that racetrack. Whenever they're in motion, the sound is always going to be distorted because the object's either moving towards you, creating a higher frequency or higher, um, higher frequency and a shorter wavelength, or it's moving away from you, creating a longer wavelength. So... The application for light here is that the same exact thing happens to light as the object moves towards you and away from you as what happens with sound. But of course, changing the wavelength of the light does not result in a change in pitch because we're not talking about sound anymore. If you change the wavelength of light, what eventually happens, what eventually has to happen is that you've actually changed the color of the object changing the wavelength from, let's say, the longer wavelength, 700 nanometer part, to maybe a shorter wavelength means that the object is going to go from red to orange or orange to yellow or green to blue, for instance. As you decrease the wavelength, you go to the shorter end of the, um, the visible light spectrum and the object is blue shifted. As you increase the wavelength, the object goes to the redder end of the spectrum. So that's where we get this idea of redshift and blue shift, and it requires understanding what the object looks like if it were stationary, at least coming up with some estimate of what the object looks like stationary. So I've got a little example for you using uh, first a laboratory spectrum uh, from what we think an object spectrum might look like stationary, mainly absorbed with three little emission lines. And then what that object would look like if it was moving away versus moving towards you. So comparing all of these other spectrum back to the stationary, you can tell if the uh, object is actually moving away from you or towards you by which direction the spectrum gets shifted in. If those little emission lines get shifted towards the longer wavelength end of the spectrum, over towards the red, then they're red-shifted objects, and red-shifted objects have to be moving away from you. If you get a bigger shift towards the redder, longer wavelength end of the spectrum, that just means the object's moving away from you even faster. So you can calculate not just the idea that the object's moving towards you or away from you, but the rate in which it's moving towards you or away from you. Now, again, let's compare all of these back to the object's uh, spectrum when it was stationary, going from object 3 down here at the bottom to the laboratory spectrum at the top. You can see that object 3 and object 4 both have a shift towards the bluer, shorter wavelength into the spectrum. They're blue-shifted objects, meaning they're moving towards you. First, in object three, moving towards you fairly fast, and object four, moving towards you even faster. So by comparing it to a stationary object, you can tell not just whether or not that object is moving towards you or away from you, but the rate in which it's moving towards you or away from you.
So redshift is the Doppler effect phenomena that occurs when an object's moving away from you. Think about these wavelengths of light as trailing out behind a moving object and being actually stretched behind a moving object. I like to think about it in terms of maybe like a spring attached to this object getting stretched out between you and that object. That's going to result in longer wavelengths of visible light, a redder shift, so redshift. If you have blue shift, that occurs when the object's moving towards you. Think about that same spring as being compressed as that object moves towards you, and the compression of the spring correlating to these distances between the coils getting shorter and shorter, that's going to be the shift towards the shorter wavelength, higher energy part of the spectrum, the bluer end of the spectrum, and that's blue shift. So based on the Doppler effect, based on this shift that occurs, either red shift or blue shift, you can tell whether these objects are moving towards you or away from you. But the trick is you can only tell that component of the object's motion that is directly towards you or away from you, both in terms of the rate and the fact that it's occurring at all. If the object were, let's say, orbiting around Earth, you wouldn't see any kind of Doppler effect at all. You wouldn't even be able to tell through the Doppler effect that this object was in motion because you would only have that component of the object's motion that's neither moving towards or away from us at all. It's maintaining that distance. That's why the sun spectrum, for instance, isn't really red shifted or blue shifted because we're maintaining a fairly fixed distance between us and the sun. But let's say we were able to see the spectrum of an incoming asteroid, for instance, and that object was coming directly towards us to impact Earth. It would be blue shifted. So if you have at least a component of the object's motion that's moving towards us or away from us, then you can detect the Doppler effect. In the three examples I have on this picture in this slide, you have first the first object, the bright, let's say, yellow star in the very first object up here with the number one on it. It's moving directly away from Earth. As you might have guessed, that is going to be a red-shifted object. And you can tell the full component of the object's move motion because it's moving directly away from Earth. In object two, you have the object moving at a 90 degree angle to a line between that object and Earth, so you can't detect that it's moving at all through the Doppler effect. In object three, the object's moving away from Earth, but at an angle. So you can only tell that component of the object's motion that's moving directly away from Earth. It would be possible, for instance, to misunderstand exactly how fast the object was moving because you're only seeing one component of the object's motion. It might be moving faster than we originally thought. Now, when Edwin Hubble in the 1930s, began to look at the light from distant galaxies and began to try to understand what was going on with that light, he stumbled on something incredibly fascinating. If you look outside of our own solar system and outside of our own Milky Way galaxy and look at the light from other galaxies out there in the universe, the light from all of the other galaxies out there in the universe is redshifted. And what that inherently has to mean is that these galaxies are moving further away from us and from the Milky Way galaxy. It means that the distances between the Milky Way galaxy and all of these other galaxies is getting greater over time. And you can still detect this today. It's not something that was only detectable by Edwin Hubble in the 1930s. Galaxies in the universe are increasing in distance away from each other because the universe is expanding. And Edwin Hubble was one of the first people to stumble upon this realization because he was able to detect this redshift of galaxies. All right, so this is really just sort of part one of understanding light and the application of light on understanding what's going on with all of these distant objects. And part two, we both look at the relationship between distance and light and the concept of a light year. And we're going to look at telescopes, how telescopes allow us to understand more about the universe by collecting more light than our eyes can and by, uh, um, by enhancing that light and allowing us to see more detail. So until next time, keep looking up.